now that we have the proper background to um, start discussing uh, calculus in dimensions higher than two, um, we want to first start before we go to like partial derivatives and differentiation and things like that. First, we just want to familiarize ourselves with how do functions, what do functions look like um, in multivariable cases? Um, what do what do their uh, graphs look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we want to build a foundation of getting familiar with the functions themselves before we start doing calculus with these functions. So we're very used to a function of one variable. Right? This is our standard y equals f of x, where y depends on x. Right, And we know if we have, algebraically, if we have this expression, then we have, geometrically, this describes some curve. Right? Now, what's the um, analogy to, say, two variables? We'll, we'll talk about uh, multivariable in the general setting, but first, let's just start with two. So let's look at a function of two variables. And so now we have z equals f of x, y, where now there's two variables um, here determining how this function behaves. And so maybe I'll draw on the next page here. So if we have a function of two variables, say z equals f of x, y, well, in one variable, a function describes a curve, right? It's a one-dimensional curve in a two-dimensional space. But what does a function of two variables describe? It describes a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. So f of x, y, z, the graph is a surface, two-dimensional, in 3D space. Right? And so we've seen examples of like spheres and cylinders and hyperbola and things like this, right? And so we can get a surface. And we want to extend some notions that we're familiar with in the uh, single variable setting to the multivariable setting. So what about things like the domain of a function? Right, we're familiar with the domain and the single variable setting. It's a set of values um, that we can plug into the function and get a well-defined answer, right? And it's the same in higher variables. It's just now there's, um, instead of it being um, just one variable, there's two, right? And so the domain this starts from understanding what the input is, right? If you have z equals f of x, y, what is the input of the function? You put in two points, x and y. So the input is an ordered pair in R2, right? x is a real number, y is a real number. And the output, the output is some number z, which is in the reals, right? So you input two real numbers, and the output is one real number. And so restricting our attention to the input, the domain B of a function is, I'll say allowable here, kind of more for intuition than rigor here, is allowable values X and Y. And so all the points X, Y are elements of the domain, but the domain is a subset of two-dimensional space, like the X, Y plane, right? So this C shape here means subset, okay? And so let's first... Um, before we do an example, let's also look at the output of the function, 
Okay, so we know the input is going to consist of uh, some subset of the XY plane. But what about output? So here, this is some subset of the XY plane. We have a point inside the domain XY, and we know the point F maps this to a real number, right? Notice the domain is two dimensional over here. The uh, where it lands, the output is one dimensional, right? And so this would be like point Z here. So we have the domain that we've discussed, but what about the points where it lands? We're used to calling it the range, right? We have the domain. Domain is possible values you can input, and then the range is all possible outputs um, of the function. We're going to kind of adapt a uh, different term for this. We'll call it the image. So we say the image, and we'll denote this by M of F, which is contained in the reals here, right? This is possible outputs of F of X, Y. So it's the set of points Z such that z equals f of xy, right? And so we'll denote the domain by d and the image, which we used to think of as the range, we'll denote this by m of f, okay? And so now let's see an example. Let's find the domain range of f of xy equals square root nine minus x squared minus y squared, okay? And so we want to first, before we start doing calculus with these functions, um, and even before we start graphing them, right? We want to understand like, what's the domain and the range? Like what values can I put in for x and y? And what values can I expect to be spit out for different, for varying x and y, right? And so, because this function in particular is a square root, we know that the inside of the square root should be non-negative, right? When we look at like root x, we know that the x should be non-negative, right? Because if we put in, we're looking in the real number. So if we put in a negative number, we would get something complex, which is not what we're what we're working with. So we need to restrict, meaning the domain of this single variable function, root x, the domain is the positive reals, right? The domain for this function is a set of points x and r such that x is non-negative, right? And so now let's look, like we still have the same thing, right? We just have more variables. So we know that the interior of this square root must be non-negative. So we can um, apply this condition, right? This is understanding what the domain is when we, we understand that you can't have negative values. So we have to set this up. Well, this is just to tell us then that uh, x squared plus y squared will be less than or equal to nine. And so this describes a, set, a subset of the xy plane, right? So d, so what is this, right? What is x squared plus y squared equals 9? Well, this is a circle of radius 3. It's a circle of radius 3. But now that it's less than or equal, that means we can include everything inside the circle. So now we're looking at a disk of radius 3 not just a circle, right? The circle is the boundary. Here we're looking at a disk of radius three, and this is our domain D. And now let's express D in set notation. Uh, set notation is very important as we go forward. We'll use it in um, double and triple integrals, and it's, it's just pretty standard convention. So now's a good time to introduce set notation. And we express D 
as a set. The curly brackets here are going to represent that we're expressing D as a set, right? Because that's what it is. It's a subset of R2. And what is this subset D? How do we express this disk of radius three, right? Well, we can pick any point X and Y, any ordered pair X, Y, which is contained in the real numbers. So what this says so far is the set of points X and Y in R2, and then you use a vertical bar. So I'll erase here the set notation. Use a vertical bar, and this vertical bar, what it means in English is such that. So this is the set of points X and Y in R2 such that, and then we impose our restriction, which our restriction is what we found up here. So this is the set of, our domain is the set of points X and Y in R2 such that X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to nine. And this is how we describe a disk of radius three using set notation. And so this is when, uh, when, when you're asked to find the domain of a function, this is how you'll want to express it. I mean, it doesn't hurt to draw a picture, right, of the x, y, but this is how you'll express your domain is using set notation. So what about the range, right, and what we're now calling the image? And this is the possible outputs. And a helpful tip when finding the image is to check the boundary and origin, okay? So here, I guess I'll redraw it. So we have a disk of radius three, and what is the boundary, right? The boundary is a circle of radius three. So we wanna check the boundary and we wanna check the origin because this will give us our maximum and minimum values to plug in or like, well, it'll get us the bounds of our image. And then we check points on the inside, which will give us um, what points we can have in between an upper and lower bound. So let's check the boundary. Right, so this is gonna be points Z such that X squared plus Y squared equals nine because the boundary is a circle of radius three. And so if we're on, if we pick a point X, Y on the boundary, we know that the sum of their squares must be equal to nine because they're at a distance of three from the origin, right? And so what does this mean? Well, if we look at Z, equals f of x, y, which was the square root of nine minus x squared minus y squared. Well, we can pull out a negative and this is root nine minus x squared plus y squared. But right now, x and y are points on the boundary. And so if you'd like to be even more particular since x and y are not varying here, they're fixed points. Let's say we pick the point x naught, y naught, to indicate that this is a fixed point and not something varying, right? We're picking a point on the boundary. So x naught, y naught, x naught, y naught, x naught, y naught. And we know that x naught squared plus y naught squared is nine. And we have then that root nine minus nine, which is zero, okay? And so it seems this gives us a bound we don't know if it's the upper an upper bound or a lower bound yet, but this gives us a bound of the image. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. And now let's check the origin, right? Let's check the origin. Well, if we pick the origin to be the point x naught y naught, then <clears throat> what do we have? We have that. We want points Z such that X naught squared plus Y naught squared equals zero, right? And the sum of squares being zero means both things have to be zero. So this implies that X naught is zero and Y naught is zero.
Okay. And then so that means when we're looking at uh, the values at the origin, we get z equals f of x, y. So I'll just repeat what our function was. It's 9 minus x squared minus y squared. So then what is f of x naught, y naught? 9 minus 0 minus 0, which is root 9, which is 3. So this gives us another bound. So this means we're bounded, our image is bounded by 0 and 3. And now let's pick an arbitrary value to make sure that we can obtain anything between 0 and 3. Because if we can't, then we have to express our image differently. And so let's check arbitrary point. Let's say we want f of x naught y naught equals some number c, right? So now we're just checking the interior that's not the origin and that's not the boundary, right? And so if we have uh, this, then we have root 9 minus x naught squared minus y naught squared. And in fact, now, since c, different c values could give different x and y values here, um, let's leave these as variables. So f of x, y equals z, uh, c, this is 9 minus x squared minus y squared equals c. So we get 9 minus x squared minus y squared equals c squared. And then it looks like we're going to get x squared plus y squared equals 9 minus c squared, right? And this here is a circle of radius root 9 minus c squared, right? And we can look at the square root and see, well, if c is 3, this is 0. And if c is 0, this is 3. And so our c values give us every circle of a given radius between 0 and 3. And so that fills out an entire disk. And what that means is that our image is the interval 0, 3. Because we're bounded by 0 and 3, and we can have a circle of any radius between 0 and 3. And so the image is the closed interval 0 to 3. And so there's um, a nice example of calculating the domain and the image of a function of two variables. Now let's figure out how to graph. So let's graphing functions of two variables. And let's kind of the best way to look at this is just an example. And let's use our same function, f of x, y equals root 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And a nice um, method for graphing functions of two variables or to understand what the graph is going to look like in three-dimensional space, because remember, this defines a surface, right? This is a surface that's contained. Whoops. This is a surface, which is a subset of three-dimensional space, right? And so a nice kind of trick or method is to use the domain and the range. Or again, let's start upgrading our vocabulary to saying image instead of range. So let's use the domain and the image to our advantage. And so let's recall that, um, I'll use a new page here. Let's recall that the domain was the set of points x, y, and r2 such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 9. And then the image was 0, 3. And this is in the z variable. Right? And so what this means is we can look at x, y, z, and we know the domain in the x, y plane 
is a disk of radius three. So everything has to be contained in this disk, right? When you're projecting to the xy plane. But we also know that the values of this function must live between zero and three. And so that tells us that we're in the positive, in the, in the four octants with a positive z value, right? But between zero and three, we don't exceed the height of z equals three. And what you can do is plug in z values, like z equals one. And so you'd have like uh, root nine minus x squared minus y squared equals one. And you can kind of check what this gives you. So at the height z equals one, it's like traces. It's exactly traces, right? This is how we figured out what certain surfaces look like in three-dimensional space. You use traces. But now you know your bounds for the traces. Like I won't go lower than z equals zero and I won't go higher than z equals three. And if you calculate a few traces, you'll see that we get the, this is an upper hemisphere. radius three. Okay, and so <clears throat> we can uh, graph or get an understanding for graphs of functions by combining our knowledge of traces with um, our knowledge now of calculating or being able to find the domain and range of a given function. And this segues these traces here. Notice when you look, so let's look actually at um, the trace at z equals one, right? That's then nine minus x squared minus y squared equals one. So it looks like we'll have x squared plus y squared equals eight. So this is a radius or a circle of radius root eight, which means at the height z equals one, so z equals one here, we have a circle of radius root eight, okay? And there's a lot of benefit and a lot um, to be learned from studying these traces. And you'll notice this is a curve here. At the level z equals one, there's a curve, which is a circle of radius root eight. And if you looked at like z equals two, then you'd have nine minus x squared minus y squared, it would equal two squared, right? So it'd be four. So then you'd have x squared plus y squared equals five. And so at z equals two, you'd have a circle of radius root five. So radius equals root five here. And then here, radius equals root eight. We know we've already calculated the, uh, the trace when z equals zero, right? It was a circle of radius three. And we've also calculated at z equals three, we add a circle of radius zero, which is just a point, right? And so there's a name for these curves at each level. And they're named pretty intuitively, they're called level curves. So here's a definition. Um, for a function f of x, y, and a real number c in the image. So let's say c in the image of f, a level curve. of f of x, y at c is the set of points that satisfies f of x, y equals c, right? Or z equals c. And so we've done this in this example for graphing 
uh, the function f of x, y equals root 9 minus x squared minus y squared, right? We found the level curve at the level z equals 0, right? So this was like c equals 0, and then c equals 1, c equals 2, c equals 3, right? What we're doing when you take this trace, the curve in, like when you look at a trace, the curve, we call that a level curve but it's not any trace, right? It's a trace when you take a plane parallel to the XY plane. So there's notions of like vertical trace and stuff like that, which we've already uh, discussed. But now when we're graphing multivariable functions, um, we take uh, the trace of, uh, we intersect it with a plane parallel to the XY plane and we call the curves that are results of these traces, we call these level curves, okay? And so we'll, we'll now start to use the vocabulary of like a level curve at Z equals zero or a level curve at Z equals one, things like that. And you can graph, you can kind of get a projection, right? So in three dimensions here, we have a hemisphere with level curves of shrinking radius as you go up, you can draw like a projection. So imagine taking this uh, hemisphere that we have here and imagine you squish it so that it's perfectly flat, right? So that it's perfectly flat. And then you can look at a handful of level curves. So if we're looking at this just in the XY plane now, we have a circle of radius three at C equals zero. And then we had a circle of radius root eight. So this is three, this will be root eight. And then we have like root five, and then we had zero, right? And you can kind of draw these level curves on the same, uh, on the same graph here. And when you do this, we call this a contour map. So, you know, like um, if you've ever examined like a topological map where it's basically they, they survey um, a given area and then they take the varying heights of this area and they pro project to two dimensional space and then describe how the height is changing in uh, in two dimensions, right? And so we call this, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a formal definition, a graph of various level curves of a function is called a contour. And so graphing contour maps can help you understand um, what the graph of a function looks like. So if we maybe just took a bunch of level curves first and then figured out what the contour map is, well, that would give us a bunch of level curves. And then we could try to figure, figure out, well, okay, how do we go back, right? Instead of projecting, how do we like expand? What does this look like in 3D? I'm looking at a 2D picture of something three-dimensional, right? So um, we can use contour maps in this way. And <clears throat> the last thing I'd like to talk about in this video is just kind of extensions to functions of more than two variables. Uh, not equal. Functions of more than two variables, right? And so you could have like, let's start with three variables. You could have like W equals F of X, Y, Z. And now this is a 3D hypersurface contained in four dimensional space. So like R4, right? Um, and then you can generalize this to n variables. You could have, let's say, uh, 
let's just use y equals f of x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn, where n is an arbitrary real number, right? And then so y is a function of n variables. Well, then this is an n minus 1. The graph of this, this function is describing an n minus 1 dimensional hypersurface. in n-dimensional space. So for example, if you have w equals, or if you have like a function of three variables where like x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared, this is a 3D hypersphere radius r, right? This is a 3D hypersphere contained in four-dimensional space. And so you can learn these things. You, you get a really good idea for how functions of multiple var variables behave just by studying what happens in two variables and three variables and things like that. And notions of the domain are the same, right? Except now, in three variables, your domain is going to be points x, y, z in R3 such that, and then some restriction based on the function, right? And then your image will still be contained in one dimensional space, but now it's in like the last dimension, right? So if you had like, maybe I could say like R sub w for the real numbers in the variable w, right? So if you have like w equals f of x, y, z, right? The domain is the three input variables and the image is the output variable, okay? And so like in three dimensions, instead of level curves, you have level surfaces, All right? So in three variables, you have level surfaces. So it's the same, it's a very, very similar definition. You just have to learn how to generalize it, right? So now, instead of having f of x, y equals c, so a level surface, so let's say a level surface of f of x, y, z of w equals f of x, y, z at value c and r, is just the level surface f of x, y, z equals c. And so you take like a trace and instead of a curve, now you get a surface. And so this is describes some surface at a given level, right? And so I think this is where I'd like to, to wrap up the video. In the next video, what we'll discuss is limits and continuity of multivariable functions. And once we have, um, a strong basis for understanding limits and continuity in multivariable settings, then we can start to introduce differentiation in a multivariable setting. And so that's where we'll go from here.